Hi, this is Daniela Camboni and welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show now on ITM Trading. Well, today I am joined by one of the world's best known mining executives. Pierre Lasson co-founded Franco Nevada in 1982 based on an original concept of building a mining royalty company. Today, it is the largest royalty and streaming company by market cap. So please welcome to the show, Pierre Lasson. Pierre. Always a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, joining me from my hometown of Montreal, uh, how, how are you, first and foremost? I'm fine. I'm very busy these days. There's so much going on in our industry, even though, you know, like people don't realize, but the gold price is at a record high. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on, but it, it's not showing up in the ETF. It's not showing up in the stock price, but it's a good time for the industry. Well, let's. that's exactly my, my, my point, because... With portfolio managers so focused on tech stocks, on bonds and whatnot, it just seems to me that despite the amazing gold price we're at, where's the interest in gold, Pierre? Uh, it's not there. It, it is not in America. It is in China and it is in India. If you look at the disparity between, for example, the gold ETF, which has been draining gold, okay, like, you know, we've, we've had over 100 tons of gold disappear from the gold ETF over the last 12 months. And yet, why is the gold price like at a record high? Well, it's because mm. China in particular and India, uh, you know, the central banks, those, those central banks last year bought 1,200 tons of gold. That is one third of all the gold produced every year. And the uh, sensibility of gold is it goes up 30 to $40 for every 100 tons. So you just do the math. The central banks of China and India in particular, China in particular, have moved the gold price by over $300 just by themselves. So it doesn't matter what the American public is thinking, what they're doing, where the gold price is being set today, it's not in America, it's in China. But does it matter, okay, you mentioned the ETFs, and the Bitcoin versus gold debate has been renewed, it's on fire again, uh, you know, I saw a headline on Zero Hedge, Bitcoin tops $1 trillion as gold ETFs dumped in favor of crypto. To give some context, since the advent of the Bitcoin ETFs, gold ETFs have an aggregate seen almost $2 billion in net outflows, while Bitcoin ETFs have seen net inflows of almost $4 billion. Now, I know you say this doesn't matter, but at one point, does it become a problem? It's not. There, my view is that there are two different markets. The uh, people that are investing in the gold market are totally different than the people who are investing in the uh, uh, crypto. And the crypto market is a very narrow market, like very, very narrow. It doesn't take much to move that market because it's like 90% controlled by just a very few people. It would be like having a stock that is 90% owned by five individuals. Well, they can control the price. And crypto is very much in that um, way. So totally different. Uh, the, the gold market is such a, you know, just the amount of gold that exists today on the planet is over 15 trillion. But to give you an idea of the relative importance of the gold market, the, the magnificent six, okay, the six largest tech company in the world by themselves have a market cap of 12.5 trillion which is absolutely mind-boggling and it also goes to the performance of the s p 500 for example it's all driven by the magnificent six because if you remove their performance everything else is actually last year was down and the only way you would have been a winner is if you're part of the index because the magnificent six did 54%. It, it's a very, very disparate market. The gold market, you know, right now there's no interest. You look at the the uh, the uh, value that you can get in the gold stock. It's incredible. I mean, you know, they're trading at like a five yield, like utilities. It does, and yet when you look at the contango, the you know, you have a contango today, which is. If you sell gold five years from now, you get a higher price than you get today. So you can assure yourself of a profit 
And that contango is like, you know, three to 4%, which is quite incredible. We're back to where we were in the late nineties, where you have like a very high contango and that the value of your reserve in the ground should be the same as the value of your net asset value. And yet none of that, they're not even trading at net asset value. They're trading as if gold was going to be like $1,500 tomorrow morning. So yes, there is an incredible opportunity right now for gold stocks. And I want to talk a little bit more about gold stocks, but getting back to how China and India get it versus North American investors. I mean, uh, besides, the, is it just mostly a cultural aspect that they've been always believers in gold? I mean, why why do they get it and not North American investors? Um, it's uh, two two things. One, it is cultural. Uh, gold has been part of uh, the uh, their economies for literally like you know thousands of years. Uh, but two, it's also being promoted by their own government as a diversification outside the U.S. dollars. Uh, if you look yeah. at uh, the Bank of China, for example, they've been laying off their uh, their T bills. Uh, they they used to have like trillions of dollars of T bills. Now they're they're down by like thirty percent. And where does that money going? In part into gold. They're diversifying their gold, their reserve, their in you know out of the dollar into gold. And uh, we're seeing that in many other central banks where they want to have a differentiation. They they don't want to be beholden to the the U S. Because they've realized that the U.S. can block all their financial system, you know, in one stroke of a pen. And they're saying, you know what, we gold, you can trade, you know, like there's always going to be a buyer and uh, it's not attached to the U.S. So it's a way to diversify your currency, your reserve. And that's what they're doing. And, and to your point, because. Part of your thesis of why you're a believer in gold, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you say the U.S. dollar has peaked and gold for you is really the anti, anti, anti dollar. Yep. Can you explain? Yeah, I mean. Why is I, it the anti dollar? You, you've heard me say it so many times on your show, Daniela, the gold is the anti dollar. When the dollar function as the reserve currency that it is, you don't need gold. You know, um, gold is an insurance policy. It's there when the dollar doesn't work, when you've got, you know, high inflation, you've got dislocation in government uh, in the U.S., uh, you've got incredible, you know, trade deficit. And we saw that in the 70s. And, you know, what did gold do? It went from $35 all the way to $800 in a period of literally like, you know, less than 10 years. And it's interesting because today we have the same conditions, but the dollar has become Tina. There is no alternative. And uh, so when you've got massive amount of money, where are you going to go? Well, you go back to the dollar because, you know, the euro is a bit of a suspect currency. It's not really a one country. It's a whole bunch of countries that have different agenda, different laws, and et cetera. You got the yen, which is a manipulated currency. The, the, the central banks that decide, okay, we're going to be so much against the dollar and they keep it there. And it's been managed for like the last 40 years. And then where else are you going to go? And uh, so gold is really the only other place where you're going to go. And when I look at the, the current dollar, um, it's overvalued, it, way, way overvalued. Only in one place, it's in... Switzerland. Switzerland, you know, if you go there, a bowl of soup, I, I was there a week ago, a bowl of, two bowls of soup, two beers and a coffee was $100. Okay, It's, it's like unbelievable. But the, the dollar yes. is way, when you look at China, they, uh, China, Vietnam, all of the Asian countries, they undervalue their currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar uh, because they're, you know, trade mercenaries. And uh, at some point, there's going to have to be an adjustment. And at that point, the, the dollar is not going to fulfill its role. Look at the budget deficit in the U.S. It's in the trillions of dollars. How long can you go? And at some point, there's, 
and then you look at you know the, the Congress is not working. I mean the the House of Republican is not working. There's a complete dislocation of government. At some point, it's going to impact the dollar, and who's going to be the net beneficiary? Gold, for sure. Before uh, I want to talk to you about monetary policy, but before we move on, you know what's interesting when we're talking about demand for gold. You know, Costco can't even keep up with their gold demand. I say that jokingly, but it's true. And if I speak to my bullion dealer friends across North America, the volume is there. People are are buying gold. Yep. Yeah, the physical Yet, gold is being bought where the gold ETF, it's investment. And right now, you know, all the fun is in the Magnificent Six. That's where you get all your performance. Right. So that's where people are going. And, and, and to your point about the mining stocks having to catch up, I mean, you know, they're, they're basically acting as if gold is $1,500 an ounce and not over $2,000 an ounce. So Correct. is it something that the miners have to do more of? Are they missing something? I don't really uh, think so, uh, Daniela. I, I think that um, you know the miners have instituted dividend policies. Uh, some of them have instituted buybacks. They are being incredibly careful with uh, the allocation of uh, their capital expenditure, their capex. Uh, they're bringing all their costs down. So the miners this time around have done everything right. And uh, you say, well, wow. you know, maybe they're not marketing yeah. enough. But you know what? They're, all the industries are in the same boat. Like the oil and gas industry is no different than we are. They're also undervalued as far as I can see. And everybody else, because there's, you know, like the, 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 the way portfolio managers invest today. You look at our, you know, pension funds, for example, here in Canada. And I'll just, you know, seg segues into it because they invest only 3% of their money in in Canada and that 3% is not even managed they buy ETF so you look at the US where does the ETF money goes well it goes proportionally 56% of it in the magnificent six so the more money comes in the ETF the more overvalued they get and the more overvalued they get the more money they attract it is completely insane, but that's the way that the world works today. I, I want to, uh, uh, you, you brought up the pension funds in Canada and uh, you and our mutual friend, Frank Justra. I mean, kudos to you both. You've just gone on a, a media blitz trying to, you know, wake up Canadians, shake up the Canadian government. And you had a compelling um, piece in the Globe and Mail. And if I could just read a bit here. The global race to secure critical minerals for our green future is on, and sadly, Canada is very much at risk of losing the plot. In the past 20 years, Canada has lost almost all of its mining giants, Inco, Alcan, Falcon, Falconbridge, Noranda, to multinationals. The solution, you both say, lies in our Canadian pension funds, dubbed the Maple 8, representing 35% of all Canadian savings. You say pension funds must look into Canada's resource sector. It's imperative for you. It really is. And uh, when you look at, for example, Australia, which would be a comparable economy to Canada, the Australian pension funds have more invested in one commodity, lithium, than all of the pension funds investment in Canada. Think about that. I mean, how crazy is that? And there's nobody in our Maple 8, as we call them, the eighth largest Canadian pension fund. There's nobody there to talk to. There's no specialist. There's nobody that looks after Canada because the 3% or less that they invest in Canada is in their, an ETF. So there's nobody there. And it is crazy for a government to spend billions of dollars to create a critical mineral policy for Canada when you've got no miners. If we don't have anybody to mine the metal, you can create all the policies you want. You're not going to go anywhere with that. And if you let all your senior companies go, which we have, and we have a few left, and if you let them go, you'll never get there. So 
you have to think that back in the 80s and 90s when we had the Falcon Bridge, the Miranda, uh, Alcan, these companies spent hundreds of millions of dollars a year in research and development and also in helping the juniors because they were very well aware that the junior mining company essentially discover 50 to 60 percent of all new deposits and for them that's their r d budget i mean you know like yes you do your own exploration but you help the juniors because you want to be there when there is a big discovery um, you know like Voices bay for example well you know who was funding that it was inco and it was tech okay uh they were funding mr friedland's company they were putting the money in Today, that money is not there, it doesn't exist. Those companies are gone. And on top of that, the public is not there. So our junior sector is dying on the vine and it, you can proclaim all the mineral policy you want. If you have no capital, nothing's gonna happen. So you have to look at where is the capital in Canada 37% of Canadian savings, it's 37%. It, there's as much savings in the pension fund in Canada as all of our banks. Think about that. And only 25% of that money stays in Canada. 75% ends up creating jobs in Vietnam, in China, everywhere else, but Canada. And of the 25%, less than 3% is invested in Canadian public equities. And of that, it's a fraction, it's a 0 0.0 invested in the mineral sector. It's completely crazy. It's 15% of our economy and there's no investment. So what we're trying to do, Frank and I, is yeah. to really sensitize you know, the, our politicians who created these pension funds that they should put some governance into them and say, hey, you've got to, you know, like look at creating employment, creating jobs, supporting our entrepreneurs right here in Canada before you put up your office in Beijing and saying Shanghai and Sydney, Australia and everywhere else in the world. I mean, it's, it's it sounds absolutely absurd to me, Pierre. And I mean, this isn't just uh an issue related to you know the liberals because this has always been the case in Canada mm -hmm. correct conservative right. liberals wh whomever has been in power so my question is why hasn't anyone thought of this I mean if you're a government if I'm the prime minister wouldn't I want to have that win and create jobs in in my country you should I, absolutely 100 percent and uh you know you look at the competitivity of uh, of canada it's been sliding for like literally 40 years well why because you know like all our money is leaving canada if we don't invest ourselves in canada who else will and that's a big question you look at for example daniela back in 1982 like essentially 40 years ago the Canadian GDP per capita was 95% that of the US. Okay, our dollar was parity with the dollar and you know, like we're 95%. Today, our per capita GDP is 72% of that of the US. Why do you think our dollar is at 73 cents? Okay, why do you think we're lacking in competitivity? I mean, like, because we don't have the investment. Are you, I mean, like I said, you've been doing a crazy media campaign and, you know, chapeau to you both. I mean, are, are you getting feedback? Is it getting any, is it landing on the right ears of the right politicians? Have you heard anything back that could be promising? Well, we've been able to make uh, presentations to uh, a number of finance ministers around Canada, as well as in Ottawa, uh, some premier as well. And uh, we're getting a very good reception. They, they have I mean, to I get, just, yeah, sorry. They have to get together at the end of the day and make a common front and decide what's going to be our policy. I mean, I'll, I'll, again, let me refer back to Australia. The Australian Superannuation Fund, which is $3.5 trillion, okay, it's even more than our Canadian pension fund. Can be shown about 2.7 uh, trillion. This is 3.5 trillion. 
they invest 22% of their money in Australian public equities. 22%. And they have the same performance as our fund here. So don't give me the excuse that you cannot perform by investing in Canada. You can. It baffles my mind that in, the, in Canadian history, there hasn't been anyone in the cabinet that looked at what, what Australia was doing, for example, and thought, hmm, maybe we should do that here. So I'm just thinking, why would there be a reason they wouldn't want to do this? No, I think it's sheer ignorance. I know it, wow. it's like, you know, you shake All your right. head, but like, that's the right. case. And uh, All right. Well, yeah. Well, I, I you know, I, I urge you and, and Frank Juster to please continue trying to uh, obviously wake up folks in Canada to this to this reality. Well, um, I, I, we are creating a wave and uh, it's going to get bigger and bigger and we're not done and we're getting a lot of support. Um, I understand that, uh, for example, the founder of uh, Blackberry uh, is coming out with an article uh, very shortly in the paper, uh, not only supporting our position, but even like, you know, giving it uh, another twist. And uh, we're going to get there. I, I'm absolutely convinced that, <laughs> number one, it's the right thing to do for Canada, and we have to get there. And the pension funds are not going to be shamed into doing the right thing. They have to be told by government because their default position is, well, our mandate is to give the best return to our shareholders. And that's why we're doing all of this. Well, that's BS, okay? Because when you look at their return, they're no different than anybody else. But they love to be able to get on a plane and go to, you know, Beijing and Sydney, Australia and, and everywhere else in the world. Do you think they would open offices in like Thunder Bay and Shibugamo? Well, not quite the same, you know, like so they have to be given a set of governance, a set of rules, and it only can come from the politicians. Bingo. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one last point, uh, Pierre, before we wrap, I want to get your thoughts on what the Federal Reserve is de doing here in the United States. Um, do you think, I mean, I just read this recent report from Wells Fargo. They think the Fed could slash rates more than expected in 2024. But we hear what Powell's saying, you know, he's kind of put the brakes on that kind of thought press process. Where, where do you think the truth lies there? What's the Fed going to do with rates? You know, the, this has been the most predicted recession, I think, in history, okay? Uh, and in a sense that uh, we've been talking, or ec economists have been talking about a recession for already almost two years. It's been very difficult to predict uh, the economy because of the vast amount of money that the uh, public saved during the COVID and uh, there's been a huge enthusiasm in spending that money and it didn't matter what interest rates were they plowed right through it but now we're getting to the end of it and i think that uh far wells fargo is probably right that at the end of the day they uh we're going to end up with a recession by the end of this year early next year and the the fed has no choice uh, but to reduce interest rate even the U.S. government cannot afford the rates that they are today. They're adding two trillions of debt every year with their budget deficit. So the the U.S. not only consumer but the U.S. government they both have a debt problem, and uh, frankly, um, there's no solution in sight. So I don't know what's going to happen. But you know, the dollar's got to go down, and if the dollar goes down, gold's going to go up again. And do U.S. equities go down? Uh, more than likely, because if, if you get a recession, well, when you know the, the the question is, what will the magnificent six do? Because when you look at you know the other four hundred and ninety four stock in the S and P five hundred, they they were down. You know uh, the 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 average was actually down last year. The only reason the S&P outperform is because of the Magnificent Six. So there's a total disconnect between these six stocks and the rest of the market. But what for you will bring the U.S. dollar down when we keep hearing, look, it may not be great, 
but it's the best house on the block, Pierre. Uh, when uh, the economies in uh, China and Europe starts to outperform the U.S. economy, uh, then the flow of money will go back to uh, Europe, will go to Asia. And at that point in time, the dollar is going to go down against these currencies. So I would expect that to happen by the end of this year. So if you ask me, for example, like, you know, do I think gold's going to go up tomorrow morning? The answer is no. I think that it's going to be uh, like, you know, sideways for the next six to nine months. But am I bullish, like, you know, medium to longer term? Very bullish. But, but you know, to your point about China, you know, we see the headlines that they're grappling with a seven trillion dollar downturn as countries, the country's debt levels are just out of whack here. So how would China be a threat? Well, the consumer is not as much in debt as uh, the American consumer. Yes, the uh, at the level at the high level, the uh, you know the various level of government, they do have a fair amount of debt. Uh, but it's a managed currency; they can do whatever they want. It's not like you know they're open to uh, exchange rate, the uh, you know fluctuation. They can do what they want. It's a managed currency, and that's why it's never going to be a reserve currency unless it's back 100% by gold, because at that point, it's gold that's the reserve currency. Uh, so, and is that going to happen? No. But why do you think they're buying gold? Okay, again, because they don't want to have to deal with the U.S. dollar. And to your so. point, I'm sure a lot of people watching will be happy to hear you see that gold will go up and that you've never really ever lost confidence in gold. I mean, Especially when, like I, you know, I, I started by talking about the Bitcoin versus gold debate. It's hard to get caught up in, you know, crypto fever, and you think, "Am I making the right decision being invested in gold?" But your your loyalty to gold has never wavered. Well, the fate of all reserve currency is to go down. It it whether you look at the British pound in the nineteen hundred, whether you look at you know the Italian before that which was the reserve currency, the Ducat, whether you look at the Roman uh, aureus, the fate of all reserve currency is to go down. And the dollar, when you look at the dollar over the last 100 years, vis-a-vis -vis gold, it's been going down. And it's always in waves. It goes up and down, it goes up and down. And right now we're at the top of the wave. So when I look at where we are vis-a-vis -vis gold and vis-a-vis -vis the other currency, whether it's this week, this month, I don't know, next month. But what I do know is that over the next four years, it is going to go down. Pierre Lassant, I always enjoy speaking with you. Thank you today uh, for all the knowledge you bring and really a history lesson. Thank you. I know you have a conference to get to. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniela. Always a pleasure and always ready to speak with you. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for all you do uh, for the industry, Pierre. We'll see you soon. And thank you all for watching. We'll have more great content coming your way. So don't forget to sign up at DanielaCombone.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.